Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago in Exodus chapter 14, looking again today at verses 15 through 20. Last week, of course, was Reformation Sunday. We talked about how was Abraham justified and compared and contrasted Romans chapter 4 verse 2 with James chapter 2 verse 21 where the critics have often said that there is some kind of a discrepancy in the text and the Bible disagrees with itself because James talks about Abraham being justified by works and Paul talks about Abraham being justified by faith and yet we showed that there is no discrepancy they both hold exactly the same doctrine and it tells us so in the text itself the last time we were here in Exodus was October 23rd and we are now on part 5 light in the darkest night so last time and by the way if you're taking notes there are little sheets inside your bulletin I hope you all got copies of the bulletin for note taking I've gone through the first seven points of 19 points that relate to light in the darkest night in the Bible so I'm going to summarize very quickly points number one through seven just run them back over for you and today we begin with point number eight I'm not sure we'll finish all of the points but we've learned seven things so far about light in the scripture. Number one, first, Jesus Christ is the one who is the light that led Israel, guarded Israel, and gave darkness to the Egyptians. He revealed God to Israel, and he's the one who reveals the Father to us. That's what's in our text today. That's where we got started uh, in this study. Is Jesus Christ is the one who is the light that led Israel? that guarded Israel, that gave darkness to the Egyptians, that revealed God to Israel, and he's the one who reveals the Father to us. The Bible begins with light when God said, let there be light, and there was light. It ends with light, and John tells us why in John 1, or 1 John 1, 5. This is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And we looked at many, many different references that tied that first point together. Second, the second thing we learned about the theme of light in the Bible, Jesus himself fulfills the prophecies of bringing light to those who sat in darkness. Isaiah prophesied this, and we find that the New Testament tells us that is Jesus. Matthew 4.16, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death light has sprung up. Paul refers to that in Acts chapter 26, 23, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and unto the Gentiles. Very clearly, that is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, a very important prophetic fulfillment. Third point that we learned, since Jesus himself is the light, all the references to the Shekinah glory speak of him. Since Jesus himself is the light, all the references to the Shekinah glory speak of him, and Shekinah glory is what we have in our text before us today. In John chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's speaking of Christ. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Jumping down to verse 9, that was that true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And this is the condemnation, down in verse 19, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Chapter 3, verse 20, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. You wonder why people hate Jesus? Because he is the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Verse 21, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Point number four that we've made already, there are two stages to being light in the world. Stage number one is, while Jesus was here, he himself was the light of the world. Stage number one, this is your point Number four, while Jesus was here, he himself was the light of the world. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, this is John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Chapter 9, the next chapter, in verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am, in, I am the light of the world. Get that phrase, as long as I am in the world. Because that brings us to point number five, which is stage two. After Jesus went back to heaven, he has called us to reflect his light and to be a light to all those around us as we walk through the darkness of the king of darkness and the kingdom of darkness. Jesus has called us to be the light. He said, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. But now that he has gone back to heaven, we're supposed to be the lights. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. 
A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Number six, we are called children of light because children reflect the character of their father. We are called children of light because children reflect the character of their father. Luke chapter 16, verse 8, And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world, and that's those who reflect their, their father, are in the generation wiser than the children of light. They act smarter than we do oftentimes. Paul continues in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Ephesians 5, 8, For you are sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Quit acting like the children of darkness. Walk as children of light. Reflect your father. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, You are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. There should be a clear distinction between believers on the one hand and unbelievers on the other hand. People, we live in a society where we're all trying to blend in and all we're turning out is Shades of Grey, that horrible, nasty film that came out some time ago. No, I did not see it, but I've read enough reviews of it to know that there's a lot of immorality and wickedness there. God has not called us to be gray. God has called us to be light. We are to be distinct from the darkness. And yet so many Christians are trying to blend in with their society so they don't face any suffering, so they don't face any persecution. Listen, we've been called to stand out and to be different because God is going to make a separation between darkness and light, just like he did on the first day in Genesis. And you know what? Sometimes that takes persecution. I sure hope you come tonight. I sure hope you come tonight. I'm showing two short films. The first one is called Hanalee. It's the story of a Dutch family that moved from South Africa to Afghanistan to share Christ. And they were there for a number of years and having a faithful witness. And then the terrorists attacked their home while the mom was out shopping and killed the dad and the two teenage children, a boy and a girl. And the mom lived to give her testimony. You'll hear that testimony tonight if you come. But be on time. Some of you are habitually late. And if you're late tonight, you'll miss that. And the second film, deeply moving, about an Iranian martyr, a pastor, who was the leader of the Protestant church in Iran, who stood up for another believer who was in prison and about to be killed and because he caused international attention to that fact the man was released but three days later that pastor Pastor Hike Hofsepian was murdered and this is a film produced by his sons with original footage from what took place in Iran, which used to be ancient Persia. I hope you come tonight. You need to understand, people, what our brothers and sisters are suffering around the world. Today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Iran is number three on the persecution watch list. Please be here and please be on time. Seventh, while Jesus was on earth, the light of the Shekinah glory was seen in him on the Mount of the Transfiguration. Number seven, while Jesus was here on earth, the light of the Shekinah glory was seen in him on the Mount of the Transfiguration. Matthew 17, 2, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. So I know I went over that fast. That's all review. Now we move to part eight. Uh, this is today. Eight, Jesus is the source of both spiritual light for salvation and spiritual light for sanctification. Number eight, Jesus is the source of spiritual light, both for salvation and sanctification. We find that in Paul's sermon in Acts chapter 26. 
to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now, we've talked in the past about salvation and its relationship to light, coming from darkness to light and salvation, but it also relates to sanctification. That's what we're talking about when we talk about walking as children of light. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and it says, inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. You're sanctified by faith. By the way, you're not sanctified by your good works. You're sanctified by faith. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, speaking of Jesus, it says, Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, that is the Shekinah glory, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. 2 Timothy 1.10, But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. You know, this is a major theme, folks, all the way through the Bible. A major theme. When God says something once, we got to sit up and pay attention and we better obey it. If he says something twice, you know it's for emphasis and you really, really better obey it. But if he says it in almost every book of the Bible and says it multiple times in every book of the Bible, what do you think he's trying to communicate? Do you not think he wants us to pay attention? And we're supposed to be children of light reflecting him in our perverse and wicked and evil and decadent world? Ninth, the light of Jesus is also the source of our fellowship. The light of Jesus is also the source of our fellowship. First John chapter 1. In fact, we find it both in First John 1 and 2, but I'll read first verse 7. But if we walk in the light, remember, we're supposed to be walking as children of light. So he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, well, obviously we're having fellowship with him, right? But you know what else it says? We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. When you're walking in darkness, you're walking in sin. You're not getting cleansed. If you want to be cleansed, you have to come into that blazing fire of the Shekinah, which burns out the sin and the dross from your life. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. What is the fellowship that draws true believers together? Participating in drug parties? No. Going to the bar and having a drink together? No. Smoking a joint of marijuana together? No. That's not what produces Christian fellowship. I mean, people might feel warm and fuzzy doing those things. But what gives us fellowship with one another is when we're both walking in the light. You can't have real fellowship with another believer who is not walking in the light, but who is walking in darkness. When that believer is walking in darkness and you're walking in the light, you don't want to rub up next to them because you're moving into shades of gray. That's what breaks fellowship when the other, or when you, are not walking in the light. 1 John 2, 9. Here's a practical test. He that saith he is in the light, so you're claiming, I'm walking in the light. Look at me, here I am. Dum -da -dum. I'm walking in the light. Oh, all the fellowship I'm having with Jesus and with... Whoa, I don't like that guy over there. I I'm not going to... What does it say? It says, he that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. You can't walk in fellowship with Jesus if you hate a Christian brother. Did you get that? I'm walking in the light with Jesus. Oh, I'm walking in the light. Oh, I don't like him. I'm not going to walk with him. You know what? You just stepped outside the light. How about verse 10? He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Very practical reality test. You're claiming a certain theology. You're claiming that it's applying to you 
Did you know people can look at you and tell whether or not you're lying or telling the truth? How does it affect the way that you walk in relation to other believers around you? Okay, point 10. Light is not only for our salvation, sanctification, and fellowship. It also characterizes our spiritual armor. Light is not for only for our salvation, sanctification, and fellowship, the last three things that we just saw. It is also what characterizes our spiritual armor. You realize if you're not walking in the light, you just lost your armor. You're running around bare-skinned. Romans 13, verse 12. Now, you all know the light, or you know the armor, rather, in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. And you can probably list it for me all the way from the helmet of salvation to the feet shot of the preparation of the gospel of peace. Did you know something else characterizes that? And if you don't have this, that armor isn't there. Romans 13, 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Hmm, interesting, a contrast between darkness and light, right? Night and day. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the, three words, armor of light. Did you know light characterizes every piece of the armor in Ephesians chapter 6? It radiates light. If you're saved and if you're wearing the armor of God, you are going to be radiating the light of Christ as you go into battle against the forces of darkness. And it's not you that will dispel the darkness. It is the light that dispels the darkness. And the only offensive weapon that you have in that entire list of armor is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And if you've got some kind of a modern translation that doesn't translate but sort of paraphrases, you don't have a, a steel sword, you've got a rubber sword. Do you radiate light? As you move into battle, and you are in battle. Whether you like it or not, you are in the battle. Stand up for Jesus, soldiers of Christ arise. Put all your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal son. Your armor radiates light. Let us put on the armor of light. Number 11. Jesus is our light now. And he will be our light in heaven for all of eternity. Jesus is our light now, and he will be our light in heaven for all of eternity. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. <laughs> Think about that. Marilyn went to heaven just 10 days ago. Bill Balo went to heaven a couple of days after that. They're in light. No darkness there. And we will be fitted out to be partakers of the inheritance. We haven't gotten it all yet, but it's coming. Of the saints in light. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him, that declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And so what do we expect when we get to heaven? Revelation chapter 7, verse 16. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. And the light of the candle shall shine no more in all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and bride shall no more be heard at all in thee. Thy merchants were merchants, great men of the earth, by thy sorceries were men deceived. But what is heaven like? Having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God, that's the Shekinah, did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. You heard me preach on that passage when I preached Marilyn's funeral. The Lamb, Jesus, is the light. 
Every place the Shekinah glory shows up, there's Jesus. And you don't need the sun and the moon in heaven because Jesus is there. Jesus said, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Jesus went back to heaven. He said, you're the light of the world. You're children of light. You're supposed to reflect your heavenly father. You're supposed to reflect the light of Jesus. Are you doing it? Or are you walking in darkness? Are you shades of gray? God separated the darkness from the light. And he has called you to be separate. Can you read it? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God separates the light from the darkness. Don't walk in the dark. And the nations of them which are saved, we're down in verse 24 of chapter 21 in Revelation at this point, shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. It just told us that Jesus was the one who gave the light. That means that Jesus, the Lamb, is the Lord God. Three verses earlier. The Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Oh, people, when I think of it, it is so beautiful. It's real. Do you understand that? We live as though we didn't really believe it's real. We live as though, yeah, yeah, that's someday, and yeah, I guess we'll all die someday, but I don't want to think about it. You don't want to think about it? The glory of heaven? Death, you just walk through a door out of this dim, faint world into the brilliance of the Shekinah glory. Jesus, the resident of the Shekinah glory, is the light. He's the one who led Israel across the Red Sea. He's the one who led Israel through the wilderness. He's the one who leads us all the way with the light of his word. That brings us to point 12. And I think this is very exciting because we see it actually in action in the New Testament. Jesus was also in the light of the Shekinah that struck Paul down on the road to Damascus. Jesus also was in the light of the Shekinah that struck Paul down on the road to Damascus. Acts chapter 9. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Shaul, Shaul, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. They do not understand, as Paul did not understand. They're not persecuting mere human beings. They are persecuting Jesus. It says so here in the text. And someday they will give an account unless they fall on their knees as Paul did on the road to Damascus, struck blind with darkness by the light. Until God opened his heart and gave him light and transformed his life and turned him around where he would serve Jesus Christ with everything that he had. Have you been turned around that way? 
Are you serving Jesus Christ with everything that you have? When you see the light, that's what happens. When you understand God has not called you to walk in darkness, He's not called you to walk in the shadow lands, He's not called you to walk in shades of gray, He's called you to walk in the light! I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, and this should be our response when we understand this point. This should be our response, not, oh, how cool. Look at that. The preacher preached a sermon about light and, wow, he tied it in with Jesus and Saul of the road to Damascus and the Shekinah that led Israel in the Exodus and protected them from the Egyptians. You know what the response should be? It's what Paul had. What were Paul's first words when he said, when Jesus said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest? He trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Not what theology should I pack into my head in the box marked irrelevant. What would you have me to do? How will it change your life? You've heard my question. You've heard it a thousand times. You'll hear it another thousand if God gives me life and lets me preach. So you say you're a Christian? So how has it changed your life? That's my question. I ask it every time someone claims to be a Christian. I ask them, oh, so you say you're a Christian. So how? Has it changed your life? Because the Spirit of God will take you as you are, but He will not leave you as you are. Your mind will be renewed, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Your life will be transformed. You will be metamorphosized until you're walking in the light and having fellowship with one another and with God's Son, Jesus Christ. The world will hate you. It hated Jesus and he was perfect. It'll certainly hate you. But you'll be the children of your Heavenly Father reflecting the light, what God has called you to do. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. I'm not telling you right now, Saul. You have to see if you're going to obey me first. First thing I want you to do is a very simple task. Get up off the ground and walk into the city. You know, when we see the light, we want perhaps to do all kinds of big, exciting things right off the bat. God just wants us to obey one little thing. Let's see if you'll do this. If you won't do this, you won't do that. A lot of you think in grand and glorious terms of all the things you'd like to be able to do to serve Christ, but you're not willing to obey the little thing right now. If you don't obey the little thing right now, you will not obey the big thing. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in that which is much. He that is not faithful in that which is least is not faithful in that which is much. God gave him one. He says, what do you want me to do? Okay, first thing I want you to do is get up off the ground and walk into the city. <laughs> Don't miss it, folks. Because most of us try to skip over the little preparation things that come first. And even then, God didn't tell him right away. Look at what it says. So Saul arose from the earth. When his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. Do you think this shook him up? I think it did. It rattled him to the foundation of his soul. Blind for three days. The man who thought he knew everything, the student of Gamaliel, one of the top seven Rambans in all of Jewish history. And suddenly he discovered everything he knew was wrong. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias! And he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the 
Lord said unto him, Arise. Now, God's telling somebody else to get up and get moving. <laughs> Saul didn't argue. Listen to what Ananias does. Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And I've seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in. Oh, he already knows your name, Ananias. You're in trouble. And putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Oh, no, it's a trap. That's what Ananias thinks. Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And that's really not what you want me to do, right, Lord? You want me to tell somebody else, right? Uh, you want me to get out of town because Saul's in town. Uh, you want me to find uh, a bunch of believers and we will sort of go and take him and give him drugs so that he can't remember anything, right? <laughs> no, I want you to go in and you can get so close you're going to touch him. You're going to lay your hands on him. What do you think is going through Ananias' mind? He's a believer. He's a real believer. He's going to be the chosen instrument used by God to bring sight to Saul, who will become Paul, the greatest missionary evangelist the world has ever seen, and he's hesitant. When we hesitate on the little things, we have no idea what the future is going to bring. When we choose not to refuse God, uh, choose to refuse God on the little things, we don't know what's on the other side of that little thing because the other side of that little thing might be some incredible thing. That's what happens here. Because two people saw the light. Saul saw it. Ananias saw it, though he is arguing with God at this point. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. What? You mean you're going to take all this good stuff for Israel. Are you going to give it to Gentiles? Ananias could have a second point for argumentation. He's not going to go to Gentiles. He's going to go to kings. And who gets listed last? And the children of Israel. Lord, they ought to be up front. For I will show him why did God use Saul who became Paul? Because God had put some metal into Paul. I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Do you want to be used by God? You better be walking in the light. Do you want to be used by God? You better have on the armor of light. Do you want to be used by God? You'd better have your soul infused with light because when the light confronts the darkness, the darkness hates it and resists it and will push back and you will suffer. You know, as you look at the ministry of the Apostle Paul, you know that Paul, every place he refers to this incident, Paul based his ministry on this incident. He based his ministry upon the appearance of Jesus in the Shekinah. He did that first when he spoke before the Jews on the stairs of the Antonia Fortress right after they tried to murder him. He's standing on the stairs and he says, and he refers back to this incident. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he saith, I am verily a man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, the city of Cilicia, and brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. In other words, you guys are in the same spot that I was at one point. I had the same kind of zeal that you have. That's why I was out there trying to kill Christians, and that's why you're out here trying to kill me today. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering them into prisons, both men and women. Paul didn't take, you know, any just plain hostage men. He was throwing them all in jail. <coughs> As also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom I also received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem to be punished. And here he tells us, 
and it came to pass. What was the difference? What shoved him into his ministry? What transformed him from darkness to light? <coughs> it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon. So it's the brightest part of the day. And it suddenly got brighter. Suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light. So I got some witnesses that the Shekinah glory was really there. It wasn't just some kind of hallucination. Everybody else saw the light. And they were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake unto me. We find out later they heard a noise, but they couldn't discern what the speech was. They didn't know that Jesus was talking to Paul. They heard some sound. We have two different Greek words used in the two texts where this is mentioned. But they didn't understand it. Only Saul understood it. Did you know many times you'll proclaim the gospel, you'll talk about Jesus, who he is, and they'll hear the words, but they won't really understand them with their heart. That happened here on the road to Damascus. They saw the light. Impressive. They heard a noise, but they didn't know what it meant because God hadn't opened their heart. He opened the heart of one man on that occasion. One man who was a chosen vessel who was going to carry the gospel to the Gentiles and to kings and to the Jews. One man who would not flinch. One man who would not walk back. One man who would not be afraid after this point because he knew, he knew the truth. If you really believe you know the truth, how has it changed your life? Do you see it changed Paul's life? Do you understand that when you come in contact with the light of the glory of God, it changes your life? And then Paul goes on, chapter 22, verse 11. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came to Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him, and he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will. Not guess at it, not have a partially knowledge of it. You got it. You know it. And see that just one. Who did he just see? Jesus. And should have hear the voice of his mouth. Who was it spoke to him? Jesus. For thou shalt be a witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. When you come in contact with the living God, you are a witness. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The disciples got that in Acts chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. Paul got it here in Acts chapter 9. Paul refers to it when he comes under pressure from his Jewish brothers. He tells them, I have been given a commission. If you have known Jesus and seen Jesus in the scriptures, God has given you that commission. You shall be his witnesses unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarries thou? If you know this, what are you doing just sitting around? <laughs> you understand the commission that was given to the disciples in Acts 1, the commission that was given to Saul in Acts chapter 9, the commission that Paul refers to here in Acts chapter 22, is when you know the truth, you do not sit around and twiddle your thumbs and wonder what's going to happen next and see who else is going to do something or whether or not you're going to get to have some help. You go and do it. Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The washing away of sins relates to calling on the name of the Lord, not to being baptized. Interesting structure there in Greek. I won't talk about it today. And it came to pass that when I was come again into Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, and I saw him saying, Make haste and get thee bold quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, but of course they will. Now, you know what? When you argue with God, you get into trouble. 
When you putter around, you get into trouble. When you don't obey immediately, you get into trouble. Paul didn't argue with Jesus on the road to Damascus, but Paul argued with him here. He says, Lord, they know that I am prison and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of the, he's, he's given all the history of it. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. So certainly they're going to listen to me, right, Lord? And he said, Depart, for I will send thee far hence to the Gentiles. But Paul had put it around. That's why he got caught. And they gave him audience under this word, and then they lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. They couldn't tolerate the thought of, Go and give salvation to Gentiles? Are you kidding me? And as they cried out and cast off their clothes, they threw dust into the air. <laughs> Paul used that incident as the basis for his entire ministry and he brings it up repeatedly in the book of Acts. Did you know he brings up this incident? I can't believe our time is gone already. He brings it up again in his defense before King Agrippa, again stating that Christ was the one who spoke to him from the kind of glory. This is Acts chapter 26. You know what? We're going to stop there. We're halfway through chapter uh, point 12. We'll come to point 13 next week about Jesus and the Shekinah and all the places in the Bible where Jesus and the Shekinah are tied together. But we're going to have to close there for today. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your marvelous word, for its power. Your word is a light unto our feet, a lamp unto our path. Father, without the light of the word of God, we are hopeless. We have the light because we have the living light, the Lord Jesus Christ, the resident of the Shekinah glory. And we have the light that points to him, which is the word of God. How can we know the light if we don't read it? How can we know the light to obey it if we don't study it? How can we have the light if we only spend 10 or 15 minutes in the morning or 10 or 15 minutes in the evening with it and don't have it memorized in our hearts so that we can walk in the light. We have to walk, which means every moment of every day. We need the word of God. The light that you have given to us for our path. Father, cause us to hunger and thirst, to crave the word of God. Make it more than our necessary food, as Job says. If we have a choice between food and scripture, cause us to choose scripture. If we only have time for one or the other, cause us to choose scripture. more than our necessary food. Not just the snacks, even our necessary food. Thy words were founded, I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Thy words were founded, and I did eat them. Man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, I did eat them. Father, make us children of light who reflect our Father and cause us to love our brothers and not walk in darkness. Cause it to be a practical love as James expresses. Instead of saying, be warmed and filled and giving them not those things that are needful for the body, Help us to know that the Word of God is not merely theological and theoretical, but the Word of God is practical. It changes lives because it is light. Father, we commit this to you and pray that you will bless it to our hearts. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.